Good evening to all from India, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Indonesia. And good afternoon to all from UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. And good morning to all from Ireland, UK, and other part of Europe. A warm welcome to this webinar. And to give you an introduction about this campaign, this campaign is Donate uh, PPE for Medical Physics. This is an initiative by a foundation by name, Ombo Rice Foundation. It is a non profitable and charitable organization focusing in the application of science and technology in medicine. I thank you all for joining this webinar today, especially thank the Professor Paul for uh, delivering the lecture today. He will be delivering the lecture today. And uh, this program, initially, we have uh, initiated for the purpose of supporting some of the remote hospitals especially the healthcare workers, those who are working in the remote hospitals. That was the intention of helping the program. But right now we have uh, participants from many other parts of Asia, especially from uh, Indonesia, Australia, and many, many places. We have many participants around the world, especially from Asian region. So the, the, you know, this is something we are going to have for the next couple of minutes from now. And uh, today we have Professor Paul. He's one of the eminent personalities in medical physics. He is one of the eminent professors in medical physics in Asia. And he is a consultant to International Atomic Energy Agency. And uh, he is the former professor of uh, medical physics uh, in Christian Institute, Christian uh, Medical College in Belo. And uh, he, is, uh, he has more than 35 years of teaching experience in medical physics. He has been teaching radiation physics to radiation oncology residents, students of master's program in medical physics and radiotherapy, imaging technology, and in CMC Vellore and in other hospitals. And he has made significant clinical uh, achievements in the past 35 years. He was responsible for the commissioning of the first radio surgery uh, unit in the country, as well as he prepared the protocol for the total body irradiation, total macro and lymphoid irradiation, and many other specialized techniques in medical physics. He has been served as the vice principal for the late health sciences of the Western Medical College, which is one of the most reputed uh, medical colleges and institutions in the country. And he was a conveyor of the Medical Radiation Technology Training Committee, or which is known as the Western Medical Association of India, from 2005 to 2019. So he has got more than 50 international publications, and he has been worked with uh, many prestigious institutions as London Regional Cancer Centre in Ontario for two years. And he is a fellow of the Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine. And he has more than 50 publications in peer reviewed journals and has delivered numerous lectures and presentations at several national and international conferences. He has successfully guided five students for the PhD program. And uh, his PhD program was from Tamil Nadu, Dr. NGR University, and uh, in medical physics. He is a member of many uh, review committees, high technology committees in the government of India as well as many other organizations, and uh, especially for uh, some of the committees like High Carbon Ion and uh, many other uh, specialized committees. And he also served with International Atomic Energy, and he's currently a consultant for uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. So I welcome him to this meeting, and uh, uh, thank you, sir. Time is yours. Thank you, Sajeev, and thanks to your organization as well as your colleagues for giving me this opportunity to uh, discuss uh, some physical aspects of uh, Triple F Beam. Uh, is my screen visible? I mean, yes, is my PowerPoint good. visible? So yes. I can now st stop my video, right? You don't need my video any longer. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks again to Sajeev for a very, very extensive introduction, which I don't really deserve. And I am no expert in Triple F when uh, 
Sajiv asked me, I thought this may be a good topic because I recently prepared for it for another meeting. So it may be easy for me to discuss with you without spending much time on preparation. Straight away, I'll go, into, go on to this. Uh, when we discuss about a triple of beams, the first question that comes up is why do you need a triple F? I'll, I'll just move to the next slide. This is just a, a list of things that I'm going to discuss, which is the genesis of a triple F properties of triple F beams and what do you do for acceptance and quality assurance and how do you clinically use it? You know, some sp cases that I will show that I uh, did and then conclude there. First question would be why flattening filter? Why do you need a flattening filter first in a linear accelerator? Uh, nowadays, uh, most of you must have seen the profile of uh, uh, triple F beam. So you know how it looks, how it looks compared to uh, double F beam. But the days when we were, I was a student, there was no way I could see a profile for a triple F beam without a flattening filter. Uh, H.E. John's and Cunningham book was my like Bible, where I could see this picture, which is very, very self-explanatory. When an electron beam of high energy impinges on a transmission target like this, most of the radiations X-rays produce, the Bremsstrahlung produce, is in the forward direction as shown here. But for low energy photons, it goes in the lateral in a particular angle. So if you see a final composite, probably you would get a profile something like this, which is very similar to we get now. I'll show you a little more on this. For example, if you look at that, this is the profile now you get for any triple of beam, right? It's quite interesting to see, which we studied theoretically with the H.E. John's book earlier. So when you don't have a flattening filter, your beam is more forward peaked. And in those days, the idea was to give a uniform dose distribution. So one would like to have a uniform beam profile. So they decided to flatten this profile and they introduced a flattening filter. So a flattening filter was introduced between the uh, target and the chamber and the final resultant beam profile became a flat beam profile. You could ask me, it is not uh, strictly flat. You see a dip at the middle, which means the central axis dose is lower than the off axis dose. This we refer to as the horns. And the reason being for this is the flattening filter, one flattening filter used for one particular energy and made for certain reference field sizes. When you go to other field sizes, it may not make it exactly flat and you tend to get a dip at the middle which is referred to as the horns at the off-axis regions. What are the implications of having a flattening filter? What you see in the picture is an actual flattening filter, which I removed personally from the Primus linear accelerator. When you introduce this in the path of the beam, the dose rate is substantially reduced. There is an increased scatter photons from the flattening filter. There is scattered photons coming out of this. And the beam, X-ray beam, which is a Bremsstrahlung beam, which is polychromatic, when it moves through this and you know, passes through this, is soft beams are cut off and the beam is hardened. So you have a beam hardening because of the high Z material. And also the it is placed on a low Z material, which reduces the electrons produced in the thin target and helps cooling the target also. And the therapeutic beams normally we use like about 10 MV or 15 MV, anything more than 8 MV would produce neutrons due to um, photonuclear interactions with the material in the path of its beam. And flattening filter is one of the main sources of neutrons from a linear accelerator. Let me go a little bit into the genesis of uh, triple F beam and you know, where it started. I think it was early in the 90s, 1991, there is a publication by Wobrain uh, from the Sunnybrook Hospital in Canada, where they wanted to do stereotactic radio surgery and wanted to finish the treatment faster, wanted to increase the dose rate, and this, thus they removed the flattening filter. So the removing the flattening filter, actually the monitor chamber was adjusted to keep the same output of 250 MU per minute, but the size of the MU was made larger. Right now, when you do your calibration, you keep one CGY per MU, but the number of MUs per minute is higher. Like for example, 10 MV is 2,400 and one uh, 6 MV is 1,400 or so. But they, 
kept the MU per minute constant, but increased the size of the MU. That is the dose per MU. And the pre-amplifier circuitry was changed to adjust the gain on the monitor chamber. The monitor chamber is now looking at a higher dose per MU, so the gain had to be adjusted on that. And as I said, the pulse rate was not altered, but the dose per pulse was altered. Dose per pulse increased by about 2.75 times. Now they were getting, instead of 250 CGY, they were getting 688 CGY per minute. And there was a decrease in scatter due to the removal of the flattening filter. And there is decrease in dose outside the beam. There was decreased dose in outside the beam. And the effective energy decreased from 2.19 MeV to 1.63 MeV for a 6 MeV photon beam. So this is because of the lack of uh, beam hardening effect there. And more importantly, you know, generally the beam steering is servo control with signals from the quadrant electrometer. You know, you have a quadrant electrometer there, which sends the signal with which the beam is servo controlled so that your symmetry and flatness are proper. And this needed minor modifications for the triple F beam. So they had to do two electronic changes. One was the servo control circuitry had to be changed and the PC circuitry has to be changed for the MU size, the size of the uh, MU, that's the dose per MU. And this dose per MU and the servo control for triple frame, for every radio surgery, they had to change that when they remove the flattening filter. When they put back the flattening filter, the circuitry board was removed. So this needed a lot of expertise from the person who was doing, and it also was little time consuming. But the interesting thing was it reduced the treatment time, which was a beneficial thing for the patient, the movement and other issues. Then they implemented this in Siemens linear accelerator first, which had a sliding flattening filter. So it was easy to implement. You don't need to remove, it can slide back and forth. Before actual flattening filter free beam came into radiotherapy, there were other accelerators that used the triple F, that is without the flattening filter. One is the Scanditronic Racetrack Microtron, which had a scanning beam which actually composed of several Bremsstrahlung distribution and didn't have to have a flattening filter. You may also know that helical tomotherapy and the cyber knife, they never had a flattening filter and not having a flattening filter was easy for them to have a compact design with the X-band linear accelerator for both helical tomotherapy as well as for cyber knife. So WFs have been considered as an integral part of medical linear for 50 years. The flattening filter was part of it. Like it was, you know, we can't imagine without a flattening filter in the early days of linear accelerator. But later, when that was the days when we wanted to have a uniform distribution, uniform um, fluence of the beam. But when SRS and IMRT came in, people were looking at having uh, inhomogeneous dose di distribution and non-uniform fluence across the beam. Then it made sense for people why to make a non-uniform beam to a uniform beam and then again make it like a non-uniform beam. Rather, you can use the non-uniform fluence to grade or some other non-uniform fluence and use it for radiation therapy. And the triple, triple F mode started becoming part of linear accelerator. What are the implications of removing the flattening filter? I will talk to you about the implications of having a flattening filter earlier. Now, what are the implications of removing it? You're removing it also not just as easy, right? I used to jokingly say, when you remove a flattening filter, the cost of the linac goes high, but there are some implications actually. Uh, removing the flattening filter, the beam output increases that we know very well because there is no attenuation by the flattening filter. The effective energy is now decreased. So the depth dose characteristics will be different. Beam profiles undergo a very different changes. The profile is not the same. And so the penumbra, how to measure the penumbra is a question. And out of field dose is advantageous to us. You also have to look at things like leaf transmission and dosimetry leaf gap. So how does the increased dose rate or dose pulse, pulse affect our dosimetry? Dose rate actually is seen to raise by about 2.3 times for a uh, open beam in the case of a triple F from double F. The performance of the ion chamber for such a high dose rate has to be checked. 
you know whether your ion chamber can measure such a high dose rate so you need to do a study actually this uh, significant uh, information about this is given in the paper by uh, Kashmore et al in physics medicine biology in 2008 where they have studied for dose rate dose per pulse effect for any chamber i think and they found that it has to be overlapping for double f and triple f and there isn't much significant variation so but however it is good practice to check it for your ion chamber and your dosimeter the second thing is the effect of steering and bending current see in a linear accelerator mechanical positioning of the flattening filter and accurate steering of electron beams are very very important your steering is very important our flatness and symmetry will go off and there will be non uniformity and you need to you know keep worrying meddling with it and keep changing it meddling with it and changing it so positioning is very accurately should be there now if you don't have a flattening filter you don't worry about the positioning of your flattening filter and accuracy of it but how does it have the steering how does it affect your profile when you don't have a flattening filter actually measurements demonstrate that for variation in beam steering and bending magnus triple f beam exhibits only half the variation of field symmetry compared to a double f beam if you see this this is a double f beam and for a 50 milliampere increase in or decrease in the current there is a change like this whereas there is only a shift small shift in the case of uh, triple f beam so this is something that you need to know when you have a triple f beam actually the steering coil current doesn't really uh, change your profile as much as it did for a double f beam and the other important thing is the beam startup characteristics you know when we started doing imrt when we started delivering small mus we were worried about the startup characteristics of uh, linear accelerator so small changes in the energy and beam positioning during startup are actually magnified if you have a flattening filter so when you don't have a flattening filter this is not very high the startup characteristic for a conventional beam show only one uh, show about 1.5% tilt in the beam symmetry for a 5 mu beam whereas for a triple f beam the same thing shows only 0.3% this is again the study by kashmore et al and which was published in uh, pmb the flattening filter is an energy sensitive component producing changes in the beam profile as the beam energy varies and actually electa uses it for servo of beam energies so for other linux it's not an issue for electa this is the, the this is the servo so one has to be mindful of that now you don't have flattening filter uh, does it mean that you don't have a filter at all no you have now changed the flattening filter with a flat filter right so the flattening filter is now replaced by a flat filter a thin plate in front of the monitor chamber are commonly used in all linux when operated in triple f mode and why do you need this flat filter the flattening filter produced electron which usually reach the monitor chamber but if you remove the flattening filter the electron fluence at the level of the monitor chamber is totally different and it's out of usual mode of operation right so it is totally different the primary electrons penetrating the target when the accelerator was operated at 6 mv more for example would increase the surface dose so having a thin plate would reduce this primary electrons that reaching the patient and increasing the surface surface dose to prevent the monitor chamber from saturation see the low energy photons and electrons when you don't have a flattening filter would make your monitor chamber almost saturate its value so to avoid that they keep this thin filter so that is another help of having a filter there it is normally recommend, recommended to have 1 to 2 mm copper plate as a thin filter but they actually use a very thicker plate you know the reason the reason is very interesting to absorb electron in case of target failure suppose if the target fails earlier your flattening filter was there to attenuate the electrons but now if your target fails it will straight away come or come down to a chamber and then to the patient so that is the thicker plates if you have it will absorb those electron in case of target failure this is something very interesting uh, thing i know i'm not sure whether you really uh, thought about this point uh, when you are using with the flattening filter beam filtered beam for example the flattened beam the beam hardening is more at the center than at the off axis see the thickness of the beam at the flattening filter is larger at the center 
and it's less. So when the B, the radiation that goes to the X-rays that go through the center of the flattening filter will have more beam hardening, more soft X-rays will be absorbed. But whereas in the periphery, less beam hardening will happen. So the if you even though you say the flattening filter brings in a uniform intensity, but it is not actually bringing in a uniform energy fluence across the beam. The energy fluence across the beam will change because of this. You can see this graph. This is the central axis. The energy is almost too higher because of higher hardening here. At the central axis. At the off axis, the energy fluence, if you see, it's towards the lower energy. But if you remove the flattening filter, you compare your central axis and the off axis, they are overlapping almost. So the energy fluence at the central axis and the off axis is the same. Right? So this is a very interesting thing which I learned recently. Um, so we did a small experiment. You know, I can't create uh, energy, uh, study the fluence of energy in a linear accelerator in a clinical setup. So what we did was, I asked my colleague uh, Timothy to do it. A very simple thing we did. Uh, how do you do your energy check? You do a TPR 2010, right? So we did the same TPR 2010 for a 6 me at the ISO center. And then we went off axis about seven centimeter to go off axis of seven centimeter. We used a 20 by 20 field size, right? So we didn't use 10 by 10. So you see there is a significant difference in the energy index. If you consider this as energy index, it is 0.72 at the central axis and 0.69 at the seven centimeter from the central axis. But if you go to a six triple F, the decrease is not that much. 0.68 to 0.66. Similarly, for 10 MV, it is 0.78 to 0.75. If it is a double F, if it is triple F, it is 0.74 to 0.73. So the previous slide, which we study, which we looked at, where the energy is lower at the off-axis regions for filtered beam, flattening filtered beam, is explained by TPR 2010 here. I don't know whether this is the right method to do it, but it's interesting. It makes us understand much better. And the beam hardening effect has one more thing, like the off-axis spectral dependence is very small in unflattened beam. So the spectral dependence of unflattened beam in the off-axis is very small. The spectrum is almost the same. So it is very favorable for dose calculation. The other thing is because you don't have a flattening filter, the electron contribution contamination is also removed. It is also not there. So your TPS can now do much better calculation, more accurate calculation. The other interesting thing, if you see, because of the spectral effect between the central axis and the off axis, I show you the beam profiles here for a flattened beam at various depths and for unflattened beam, triple F beam at various depths. Here, the shape is the same, whatever the depth is, only the divergence, the profile is larger. But here, the shape also changes, you can see. Here, it goes up and then comes down, whereas at a depth, it goes like this. This is because of the spectral variation between the central axis and the off axis region. Okay, let us look at now the energy index. I, we discussed, uh, discussed this, but I have a small interesting point to show that why I brought in this slide. If you look at the TPR 2010, I did it for a true beam. You know, normally when you do work on a LINAC, you have a lot of energies in electrons. Now you see, I worked with the LINAC where I had to work with six photon energies, right? A lot of work, you know, in uh, commissioning. Six X, six triple F, eight X, 10 X, 10 triple F and 15 X, right? It, is, uh, it was really annoying to do so many calibration and we may not use 15 and uh, maybe even eight, but it's interesting physics. If you look at for six X, it is 0.665 is the TPR 2010, but when you go to triple F, it is 0.628 it is lower, right? Similarly for 10, it is 0.736 and 0.705. But if you look at 10 triple F compared to 10 X, it has come to 0.705, which is almost equal to an eight X with double F. So the energy, uh, the flat uh, triple F beam of 10 X, 10 is almost like same energy as an eight X of flattened beam, uh, you know, flattened beam. 
So this is uh, something interesting data I did for Edge as well as for TrueBeam STX, and uh, the data were like if you take an average, they all come to point some six six or six six five or something. It's almost the same for all the three machines. The other interesting thing is the build-up depth. You know, when you have an unflattened beam, that is, there is no beam hardening, so you have a lot of soft X-rays. So you tend to think your build-up depth should be much smaller than that you have for a regular 6x for example say for example if you have for 6x 1.5 or 1.6 this is much softer it is equivalent to like 4 mv or something mev or something so the build up depth should not be 1.5 1.6 should be smaller but actually if you see it is the same it is because the reduced collimator scatter increases the build up in double f you have a lot of collimator scatter which you don't have here. See, these two are competing things. One decreases the buildup, other one increases the buildup. Effectively, your buildup for 6x and 6 triple F are almost the same. 6 double F and 6 triple F are almost the same. Same thing with 10 double F and 10 triple F. I hope you make this point. This the soft component of the X-rays actually should reduce the buildup, but the scatter uh, should uh, increase the buildup. The lack of scatter should increase the buildup. So you have the same buildup for 6x and 6 triple F. Let us look at the surface dose. There is a slight increase in the surface dose when you remove the flattening filter, particularly if you're working with a narrow beam because you have a soft beam. The soft beam will bring in you know, more surface dose because more low, low energy X-ray components. So you will have more surface dose. But as you increase the field size, you know, what happens is your surface dose doesn't increase very much for triple F, but increases a lot for a double F because when you go for a larger, there is more scatter. If you look at this table for 10 by 10, for example, if you look at for six double F, it is 26%. And triple F it's more, 33 percent. But if, when you go for 30 by 30, it is more for double F. It is less for triple F. And there's more pronounced in 10 by 10, as you can see, 40 percent and 32 percent. Probably if you've gone a little further here, it would have been pronounced here also, as you can see in this graph. The surface dose is more for small field size of triple F, but less for large field size of triple F, because there is certainly lack of scatter when you have the triple F less scatter due to that. The other interesting thing is the peripheral dose. You know, we have been saying you removed one component from the LENAC, which was contributing to a lot of scatter. Now that component is not there. So naturally the scattered dose is less. So the peripheral dose should be less with uh, triple F B. So we did some measurement at two meter distance for various angles from the gantry, as you can see in this picture, you can see that for six triple F, it is almost half that of six, uh, six double F and 10 triple F also, it is less than half of 10 double F. It's all measured in micro sievert. And you can see it is 68 and 26. So significant reduction in the scattered dose when you use a triple F beam. The other thing is the neutron. Therapeutic beams, as I said earlier, with the energy is greater than eight and we undergo photonuclear reactions and produce, interact with the high atomic number material. When they do that, they undergo photonuclear reaction um, and they produce neutrons. Particularly, it happens in the treatment head when they interact with the various collimators and other things. And the neutrons have high radiobiological effectiveness and therefore it is of concern in radiation protection. One of the main uh, new sources of neutron is the head, LENAC head, and the flattening filter, right? The flattening filter in the LENAC head. Now, if you remove that, then there is a significant reduction in the neutron production. So it is not really a major concern. And moreover, most of the LENACs uh, that have the triple F, except Siemens, which is not in the market now, uh, have not very high energies with the triple F. So the neutron is not an issue even otherwise, and you don't have high energy beams where you have to worry about neutrons. And we also did for 10 MV some neutron uh, measurement. There's something interesting which I want to uh, share with you. For example, if you look at this, I have for 10X and 10 triple F the neutron measurement, that is the micro sievert per hour at one meter and two meter. For 10X, it is 16 micro sievert for 
10 triple F, it is 20 microsievert. I just said with triple F, the neutron should be less. But here, if you see, the neutron contribution seems to be more here, right? So you must be concerned, but it is not correct way of saying it. That is the reason. For example, this is per hour. Let me call it per minute. Per minute, if I use a 10 double F, I will give maybe 600 EMU or 600 CGY, and I get uh, six microsievert. If I use 10 triple F, I will have 2,400 CGY, and I get 20 microsievert. So when I normalize this to the photon, then 10 triple F actually gives you much, much lower neutron contribution, right? Compared to 10 double F. So it has to be normalized to the amount of photon that it generates. There are special consideration you have to look at when you calibrate a triple F beam. Actually, I took it from AAPM report. One is the energy and the beam fluence spectrum you have to be mindful of. And as per AAPM protocol, you need to use an 1 mm filter for removing electron contamination for determination of KQ. It is not required for TRS-398, but this has been a question mark whether you should use this or not. But now they say it's prudent to use this unless it is proved it is not necessary. And increased dose per pulse, so higher correction of uh, P ion, we will look at that. Calibration of ion chamber volume and its position is very important. The volume of the ion chamber that you're going to use and how you position in your triple F beam is important for calibration. And as I said, TG51 requires one mm lead filter. Uh, this is to reduce the electron contamination at Dmax, but it's again unclear whether you need to use it or not, but it is prudent to use it. Let us look at positioning of and volume of the chamber. See the radiation beam profile for triple F is forward peaked. So if you have a large volume chamber, there will be a partial volume averaging will happen. Actually, it has been measured for formaldehyde chamber by Cry et al. And it is to be 0.2% they are given for both the energies. The other important thing, so you anyway, you need to check whether there is any volume averaging per formal type they have done. And other thing is your positioning. It has to be exactly at the center. If you slightly position off axis, there will be a gradient of dose and you will have an averaging effect. So positioning has to be very correct and the volume you have to make sure there is no averaging of the dose there. So the other thing is the ion recombination. The increased uh, dose per pulse of triple F beam results in increased ion recombination factor. So the P ion correction has to be a larger one, like the one you give, we call it uh, K in the TRS-398, they call it P ion, I think in APM one it has to be a larger one. You can use the same two voltage formalism and the approach was found to be within 0.3% for formal type chambers. And of course the P ion will be slightly larger by 0.3%, but anyway, when you use the same two voltage method, you will be able to identify what is the PI on correction needed. And the output factor in here, it's another thing. We have been saying there is less air scatter. So what happens with that is another interesting thing. The concept of output ratio in the air, that is SC, was introduced to characteristic how the incident photon fluence per MU varies with the collimator. Some of the treatment planning system ask you to input SC and SP, I understand. But with Eclipse, we do only the output factor. And this quality quantity is called the collimator scatter factor, as I said earlier. And for triple F beam, the increase in SC from 3 by 3 to 40 by 40 is like 3% to about 1% for a variation of 3 by 3 to 40 by 40. Whereas for double of beam, it is 8% to 7% increase. So, and for a clinically used beam of about 5 to 20 centimeter square, for triple F, it is only 1.5% increase. So, this is something which is very important and in interesting to note when you do the uh, commissioning of a triple F beam. The last thing is the beam penumbra. You know, the profile is not the same. So how do you measure beam penumbra? Either the 20% to 80% is okay for this. Quite a few people have worked on it. And as you can see here, this is by the 
Onish et al. who said, what you do is you find the inflection point for the unflattened beam and the inflection point for the flattened beam. So flattened beam and the unflattened beam and take the ratio and normalize to the central axis dose. And then you do the same 80 by 20 here in this and you bring it here and calculate 80 20 for the beam profile. But later, there were other studies which said the detector resolution could affect this method a lot. So they actually had a third derivative and renormalized uh, the triple up beam with the double up beam. See what they took a point somewhere here and like your double up beam and renormalized this to 100%. Right. And then you take the same uh, 80 by 20%. So the renormalization method is given that equation has been provided. You should use this equation to renormalize your graph and then calculate your penumbra here. The atomic energy regulatory board has a totally very different uh, definition in India for the triple F beam. They have defined two points called PA and PB which are located at 1.6 and 0.4 times of the relative dose factor. And these points are to be identified first. The lateral separation of these two points will measure the penumbra. So first you have to find what is PA, where is PA and where is PB and find the distance between them and that will provide the penumbra. They also gave one more thing called degree of unflatness a measure of the degree of unflatness, where they measure the 60% to 90% and 75% profile width from the central axis. And they use this as the degree of unflatness. Both are to be determined while commissioning a triple F beam for the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board purpose. They actually gave a task group report where these two are important. So when we did our beam in Velo, so it was a bit difficult to find for, for me probably you would do it. I saw some people doing it very easily uh, to determine the PA and PB. So what I did was I wrote a small MATLAB uh, routine to determine this. So what the MATLAB routine does is it goes from here and determines where the slope is one, you know, calculate the slope. Okay, the slope is one here. It will take this point and come back from here and where the slope is one and take and take these two points and take the midpoint of it, which is the relative dose factor value. This is the H and you take the midpoint of it. And then you take point 1.6 times here, go up and note the PA and go 1.4, sorry, 0.4 times down and note the PB and look at the separation between them, which will be the penumbra. So I just did a small uh, MATLAB routine, which gives me an output like this made my life a little easy when we were commissioning the triple F beam here. And it also gives you a degree of unflatness measurement that 90, 75 and 60% uh, width of the profile. Okay, let us come to some clinical implementation. I'll take a few more minutes to explain this. So now we looked at triple F beam when you go clinically. Uh, my first question was we were one of the SRS uh, people in India. We started SRS for a lot long, long time ago, more than uh, 24 years we have been doing SRS. And interestingly, we still use static DD CRT type of SRS, right? And uh, whether we can use a triple F for that was the question because it has got a peaked one. If you're using um, uh, IMRT or uh, VMAT, that's fine. But if you are using a 3D CRT, whether you can use this. So what I did was I compared the profile of uh, double F and triple F and looked at where it actually changes. So this is for a one centimeter beam profile and they both overlap. So if I'm using one centimeter, I treat one centimeter lesion or less than that, I can use triple F profile. It will be the same like a double F profile, but the advantage I will get is less treatment time, right? I can still do static 3D CRT type of SRS. And then I tried for two centimeter. It is overlapping with triple F and double F profiles are overlapping. Went for three centimeters. It's a very small difference, but it's still almost overlapping everywhere. And when I went to four, there was a slight difference and five, six big difference and the difference started increasing. So as you can see here, so up to three centimeter, there is no problem. 
So we decided we can use safely like we use double FB, the triple F frame for stereotactic radio surgery with conformal beams, regular conformal beams. And the advantage we get is much less treatment time. So I to before we clinically go, so we thought we will do some studies. So I took about 30 patients of acoustic tumors and compared the plan with double F and triple F. The number of beams ranged from five to nine. Our coverage, PTV coverage is 80%. We normally don't give margin. That's the you know, school of thought and the practice at our hospital. Most critical organs like eye, optic nerve, chiasm are totally not in the path of the beam is avoided. And the PTV volume ranged, what in the, the cohort of 30 patients I had, ranged from 4.49 to 8.1 cc, and the mean being uh, 2.9 cc. When we did uh, average value, the V80% was about 95.38 percentage of the volume, uh, whereas where the triple F it was 94 points. So it's not a big difference, it's like 0.5 percent. And the maximum tumor dose was actually slightly higher with triple F on an average, and the conformity index was almost the same except triple F had a slightly lower, but it did vary between the cases. And the gradient index was again almost the same, 2.73 and 2.74. The gradient index I measured was V50 by V80. <clears throat> so this is the case study one of the 30 patients I did. Uh, it's the smallest volume of 0.493 cc. And you can see there is not a big difference in the V80, that is the tumor volume coverage. Maximum dose is almost the same. Conformity index is not very different. And the brainstem dose, actually in this case, it's a little lower than uh, the double F in the case of triple F, but it's not necessarily for every patient. So this is the um, DVH. Uh, you can see a very small change here in the DVH. And for brainstem, it is almost like overlapping, not a big difference. And for another distribution, I just skipped one. It's for the largest uh, field size. And V80 is again 76.9 and sorry, 97.6 and 96.4. And the DMAX is very nearly the same. And the conformity index was also the same. So this is the beam pro uh, DVH comparison for these two, a slightly lower DVH I get with the triple F beam here. So the radio surgery with, if you do IMRS, how does it happen? So I with double F and triple F, I did the IMRS for this, but my feeling is like 3D CRT was as good and we could do a good, uh, uh, when you compare between double F and triple F, triple F is as good as double F or lesser treatment time. So when I went to IMRS, it's again 93.78 and 94%. The brainstem wire was less and the gradient index was cheaper for triple F and the mean Total EMU for double F and triple F plans were nearly the same. And it was the EMU was about 6,039 and 5,900 uh, 5, for triple F. So this is actually a dose distribution between uh, double F and triple F. Um, this is for double F and this is for a triple F. And the dose volume histogram actually all you know, overlaps for the brainstem as well as for the tumor volume. We, I also looked at SBRT. I took a level, level lesion of 3.8 centimeter diameter equivalent and with, with VMAT, I used 6X, 6 triple F and 10 triple F and single and double ox and just looked at what, how, which one would be good. Like you can see that this is six double F and six triple F VMAT single arc and of course, where the double F, it is uh, triple F, it is slightly lower uh, coverage here. Very, very small uh, difference. And with the 10 triple F single and double arc, uh, the single arc, of course, is slightly lower here. It's I actually uh, tabled some of the parameters between uh, 6X, 6 triple F with the two arcs, 10 triple F and 10 triple F two arcs. You can see that the V95 was almost the uh, same. There was not a much big difference. And V50 was again almost the same. And where we were gaining was in the treatment time. Look at, for 6X, we get about 200 seconds to deliver the same thing. With 6 triple F, for the same dose, we need only 84 
seconds and when i use two arcs it is 10 but when i go to 10 triple f it is only 44 seconds and 60 seconds with that and the average speed of the gantry varies from 0.9 to actually here it is six right so <clears throat> There is a significant advantage in using six triple F as far as the uh, treatment time is concerned. So, what are the advantages of uh, triple F beam reduction in head scatter, which is about seventy percent, decreased penumbra, and lower dose outside the field edge, doubling of dose rate, uh, useful for small radio surgery fields and for SBRT, and of course you can use it for IMRS and IMRT also. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. If you have any doubt and if I can explain, I would be happy to share. Uh, thank you, Professor Paul, for the impeccable presentation. And uh, although I have many questions in my mind, I would uh, give this opportunity to the audience for questions because of the we are running out of time now. So, so, if there is any questions from the audience, they are feel free to type it on the window, which is in front of you in the box, or you will be able to talk using your uh, microphones. So I have a question regarding the surface dose that you have stated, especially when it comes to tomotherapy and radixab. So when we are using the tomo technology, see if the triple F beams makes a contribution in the increase in the surface growth. How will be the you know the future technologies which are coming up with the radixab, lithos, reflexion, all these kind of new treatment technologies are going up with the you know, triple F beams. See, uh, actually, I said uh, the triple F beam when you use the surface dose is larger for narrow beams. But when you go for larger linear accelerator beam where the scatter overtakes that, the surface dose actually is not a big contribution there. It's not a major contribution because of triple F. When you go for a smaller field size, then soft component of the, because of the softer component of triple F, the surface dose is higher. But when you go for a larger field size, it's not there, right? So that's what I actually mentioned. But if you're going for a tomotherapy, yes, it is a small field size, so you will have little higher uh, surface dose. You can't, but I'm not, a, no expert in tomotherapy. I've only seen that equipment. I never worked with that. Okay, thank you so much, sir. And there is a question from the audience. Can you please explain about dose per pulse? Basically, they mean dose per mu there, right? Uh, instead of uh, saying a dose per mu, I think it is, a, I took it from a very old uh, paper, that's a 1991 paper. So they are explaining that, uh, the, you know, in the terms of pulse, you know, linear accelerator is a pulsed beam, right? So they are explaining in terms of pulse. Otherwise, you can just assume that what I meant was dose per mu. I think there is an audio issue, so maybe yeah, I will. Maybe you can type the questions. Uh, there is a question. Any SP special chamber recommendation for triple F beam commissioning? Uh, the, whatever I said, like you can use a six, uh, you know, regular farmer type, but make sure the beam, uh, the ion chamber you use is uh, suitable for the high dose rate 
and for also the profile that you have there is no volume averaging effect you have to check those two that's all otherwise you can use any format type chamber for triple up beam you don't need to worry about only thing is when you go for high dose rate it should be able to measure so there you do a check of the linearity there and also check whether the volume averaging is there or not as i said it's they measured it to be about 0.3 percent for farmer type chamber which is 0.6 mv if you use smaller chamber it is much better but good to use 0.6 uh, cc chamber right Uh, there is another one more question. Can we measure the output factor for triple up for small field without using the reference chamber? Uh, output factor. Normally, when you measure output, we don't use a reference chamber. Right? Output is itself as you are taking between. Uh, it's okay to measure without. Uh, because output should be measured the same output factor should be measured the same way you measure the output right so when you measure your output using trs 398 or apm protocol you don't use a reference chamber there right so the same condition you can use that and uh, there is one more question can ff beams be used for breast mrt with the conventional fractions like uh, two grade per fraction I don't see any problem in using for IMRT because the triple up beams were mainly was made for IMRT, but it depends on your clinical decision. You look at the distribution, the distribution that you arrived at is acceptable for the tumor volume, then why not? I know I don't see any problem in using it there because the rest of the characteristics are same. Your D max is same and except the dose rate is higher. But you are doing IMRT, so the beam flatness is not an issue there. I think you can, but make sure that you get a distribution that is acceptable for the tumor volume that you have. There is another question which is the same you have already explained. Okay, how is uh, cross calibration in triple F beams? You, why do you need to? Cross calibration is usually. Okay, this is an interesting question. I have to give some credit for the question, no doubt. Uh, cross calibration, uh, you are doing at the central axis, right? So as long as you position the chamber properly, you can do cross calibration there. Absolutely no problem. Make sure you have the proper chamber for your output and you position it accurately. What is wrong? You can do it. Absolutely no problem. But normally we don't do a cross calibration for 6MV, we do it on cobalt. But I think countries where they don't have cobalt, they straight away do it on higher energies. That's fine, no problem. So there is one more question, the size of MU, how it is increased or decreased? Uh, size of MU, that is the dose per MU. Yes, that's what was said. So you increase the pulse rate for that. You know, naturally it will increase the output. That's how, but uh, I'm not able to explain more than that at this moment. Um, if you have seen how the MU is being adjusted to get it one MU per CGY, then you will understand how you can change the dose per MU. So I think you do it, but if you're doing it on a, a true beam you do it on software so you won't uh, really understand it very well because you just enter the value but if you are doing and using it using an ix machine like clinac and all you need to physically change the potentiometer and to get one mu one cgy per mu so that is exactly what you are doing that is the size of your dose per mu that is what you are changing there 
when you set it to one CGV per mu. Sorry, I won't be able to explain much more on that because I'm not prepared for how actually the electronics or the system works on it. Um, maybe sometime uh, if you correspond with me, I will try to explain you that. Uh, sir, one more question I have here is, uh, there are many more questions, but probably uh, some of the interesting questions uh, they are asking now is uh, how can we measure the output factor for the triplet for small field without using a reference chamber? See, um, if you're measuring on LINAC, I would suggest you have to use a reference chamber. For output, uh, it is not a major issue like when i do the output measurement i don't use a reference chamber right output measurement i don't use and the same condition i do the output factor also so i actually don't use a reference chamber but when i do the profile and depth dose i do use a reference chamber whether it's a small field size or a large field size so your question is when you go for a smaller field size placement of your reference chamber becomes a problem it will hide your actual chamber receiving the radiation from the collimate there are different methods people have overcome this one of the thing is you can you know go a little above and place it uh, in such a way that it doesn't affect like you have a smaller collimator and above that you have a bigger you know primary collimator if you can place somewhere there it is good and i have seen some hospital they take the uh, monitor chamber output and use that as the reference because they cannot place another chamber there. You can even take the moni monitor chamber output and use it as your uh, you know, reference chamber for your verification. So that is also one possibility. When I used collimators, uh, small collimators, cones for radio surgery, I used to keep the ion chamber between the cones and the primary because the primary one little larger than the cone. So I used to put it uh, there in between. It is a it is a difficult thing when you want to do for very small field sizes. Keeping an another chamber in the path of the beam is a difficult thing. You can find some innovative method. Like I said, one was to use the monitor chamber itself. One uh, one hospital they were using it like that. The other thing is you can find a way to take your iron chamber a little in and put it inside so that it doesn't actually uh, it's little above the collimator and keep it but that is a very difficult thing if you are having a tertiary collimator then you can do that if you are straight away having a primary collimator of one by one that is a very difficult thing to do so another question is can we use triple f beam for tbi and during imrt using uh, triple f beams the dose rate actually less of the order of 500 or 600 mu per minute so why is the large dose rate is used there are two questions. One is, can we use triple up beam for TBI? And the uh, second question. Yes. Yeah. First, I will answer the uh, TBI thing. Why do you want to use is my question, right? Because one of the aims of uh, TBI is to get a uniform dose towards throughout the body within plus or minus 10 percent. There we not go by five and seven percent. We go plus or minus 10 percent. When you want to deliver a uniform beam. Why do you want to use a triple of beam, which is totally non-uniform and struggle to make it? And another thing is it has a very high dose rate. When you do TBI, you are trying to reduce the dose rate and use less than 10 CGY and all. So I wouldn't use that, right? Uh, I don't see any reason I should go for a triple of beam for a total body radiation for two reasons. One is non-uniformity. More importantly, is when I do TBI, I want to keep my dose rate as low as possible maybe around 10 cg one. So that's that's one thing. Your second question of why do you, when your MU per minute is uh, lower, why do you want to use that? If you look at my one of my last slides where I have compared uh, various uh, VMAT uh, treatments, can you share my screen now for a moment? And are you seeing my screen? PowerPoint? Yes, yes. yes okay, yes, yes. so if you look at that, see in spite of the fact that Sometimes the uh, MU per minute is reduced instead of 2400, it goes down. You see, I only spent 60 seconds to deliver the same dose with 10 triple F compared to 
or maybe let us take six x six triple f i to spend only 80 seconds whereas i spend about 200 seconds to deliver the same more importantly if you are doing a breath hold technique for example if you're doing a breath hold technique the patient cannot hold the breath for minutes patient can hold the breath for 15 seconds to 20 seconds you have to deliver the particular beam during that time so there this is very very helpful i forgot to mention in my powerpoint but breath hold technique is an important thing where triple f is useful and we do use uh, my colleagues tell me that they do use it so there are many more questions in the from the audiences maybe i will we will stop with the one more question i have another five minutes no problem if you want to otherwise oh. uh... okay there are how can we measure the okay that is a different question okay how to calculate the unflatness flatness and symmetry of beam profile flatness and symmetry um that is totally a different uh, thing i didn't bring it up in my powerpoint uh there is no flatness it is unflattened beam right so degree of unflatness is the one that i spoke about aerb has a method of measuring degree of unflatness whereas they measure the width of 90 percent 75 percent and 60 percent profile so i will show you in my degree of unflatness see this is where the degree of unflatness measurement only aerb wants to us to do this and this is required for our commissioning and uh, this the other one is the symmetry symmetry is what you the area under the curve so if the area under the curve here and the area under the curve here are same the symmetry so if you can use the area under the curve you can easily do the symmetry but flatness is not possible what you measure is unflatness here so another question is uh, what is the yeah what about the choice of deeper tumors keeping a pdd and surface loss in mind for ff and triple fb Mm. It, you know, it is a clinical situation you can choose depending on the distribution and uh, surface dose as i said earlier if you are unless you are using a very small field size the surface dose is actually less with the triple f so you can safely use triple f one is the surface dose what was the other one pd pdd pdd mm. is only some three percent less and if you are using a, for example imrt or vmat you know these are all compensated it's not going to affect so you can use but it depends on the distribution you get you can try both and whichever you are comfortable with should be able to use it but don't worry about the surface dose unless it's a very small field size the surface dose is not very high with the triple f is there any difference in qq and kq for ff and triple f beam dosimetry is there any radio biological difference between ff and triple f for SRS um, sorry, I won't be able to answer on radio biology part of it. I'm not a radio biologist, uh, but I don't see any big variation. The only thing is the dose rate effect will be there because you are using a high dose rate. Uh, and I would like to refrain from answering that question because I'm not a radio biologist. The other question, was, first question was on the factor KQ, was that? Yes, KQ. Any difference in KQ for triple KQ F? KQ will be different because your TPR 2010 is different. So KQ will be different for uh, 6 triple F compared to 6 double F. Certainly, you can't use the KQ of 6 double F for triple F. You have to measure TPR 2010 and go to the table in TRS 398 and look for the KQ value there. And uh, is it okay to use 0 0.6 cc chamber for absolute dosimetry of triple F beams? we use that you can also use but please make sure that you position it correctly and there is no volume averaging it is not there okay for 6 mb 10 by 10 the volume averaging is very less uh, but if you go for uh, 10 uh, 10 triple f it'd be much narrower but still as you saw in one of the studies it's only 0.3 percent if at all it's there so you can safely use another question is can we use triple f for ebrd 
what is that can we use triple of beam in apbi or abrt accelerated uh, partial breast treatment that's what they are talking about yes yes um, I'm not an expert on uh, breast treatments, though, but I don't see any reason to say I don't want to use it. It all finally depends on what type of distribution you get. You can't do 3D CRT with the uh, triple F, of course, for such large tumors. You can do IMRT or VMAT, but finally it depends on your distribution. And for profile measurements, which chamber are you recommending? Outdoor bed divert or ionization chamber? 1.125 cc semiflex or equivalent let me let me not be company specific okay 0.125 or 0.13 uh, should be fine the water fandom to not per to perturbate the measurement in collimator factor and pdd and profiles in small fields so there is a question Can we place the reference chamber for triple F in the bottom of the water fandom to not perturbate the measurements in collimator factor and PDD and profiles in small fields? How can we measure the? Yeah, that is a question. Uh, that is an interesting thing. I never thought about keeping it uh, at the bottom. I don't know. Like uh, I don't know whether people have done it, but uh, immediately I do. I couldn't think of anything against it. But we'll have to think a little more on it before I answer that question. That's a very interesting question for me to think about. But I don't think I can answer straight away. Okay. Uh, provide the benefit of uh, 6MV beam, CLN treatment, triple F and apply uh, FF beam, which is better. And also, another question is for CA prostate, FF versus triple F, which may be better. Non-clinical aspects. Okay. See, um, if you're doing VMAT or IMRT, it doesn't matter whether you use triple F or double F. Triple F may be better because of it takes less time to deliver the same dose. Okay. So that may that way triple F would be better. But you will have to look at the distribution you made with six X and six triple F and decide on which one is better. So that is about prostate and even for lung but for lung i would say the one thing is the electron thing so you have to be uh, very careful about not using you know very high energies there so the dose to other parts of the lung you have to be a bit careful about i, I won't say much about it now but uh, um Sajiv, if you can just note that person I can communicate later on that. Yes, sure. Yes, yes, sure. I think although we have a number of uh, questions from the audience, we will close the session for now. However, we Thank will you. answer some of them in person because we don't have time for uh, answering all the questions for the moment. So, but we will try to communicate them through email. So, once again, I thank you, sir, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation and for you know answering all the questions from the audience and uh, we are blessed by you either today and uh, we thank all the audience for the cooperation and for the questions so we will meet you again for the next webinar on 10th of june thank you very much uh, sajiv you? just one one small thing uh, if people can give feedback on that lecture sure. to you or to me directly whether uh, negative uh, yes, or yes, positive, whatever it is please welcome that it is there. So an email will be sent to all the participants to give a feedback on this, and that will be shared with you. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you.